Well, here we are in the midst of the season of Epiphany. That's why we still have all the light up in our sanctuary, because Epiphany is the season of light. And we've been... We're in the midst of a um, sermon series on... Um, just hold on a second. Hello? Yeah, I'm a little busy right now. Yes. Mom, I've told you not to call me on Sunday morning. <laughs> Yeah, I'll talk. Yes, I'm eating plenty. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Sorry about that. So today, the spiritual practice that we're talking about is unplugging, get ready, getting rid of the distractions that distract us from the life of faith. And our text this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58. Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look. You serve your own interests on your fast day, and you oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then, Your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. So I have a question for you this morning. If if you were given permission tomorrow to let go of one aspect of of your life, some responsibility, some chore, some habit, that if you could let it go, even for a while, it would make more room in your life for peace and joy and contemplation and love, what would you be willing to let go of? Work, laundry, yeah. Another way to think about this is as you, as you think over your typical week, all the things you fill your week up with, all the things you have to do, all the things you choose to do, what in your week is actually sort of crowding God or God's love or God's spirit out of your life? St. Augustine famously said a long time ago, God is always trying to gift good things to us, but our hands are so full that we're unable to receive them. Think about that image. That here, God is trying to give us joy and compassion and peace and opportunities of grace, and yet we're so busy, our lives are so caught up with everything that we can't receive those good things even when they come right in front of us. Imagine that your life is like a box. We all have our box. You've got it with you right now. It's invisible, but you have it with you. And we're always putting things into that box to fill up what our lives are all about. We're putting things in there all the time. But the question is, what are you filling that box up with? Are all the things you're putting in that box filling your life with purpose and meaning? Or if we're really honest, do we sometimes fill that box up with a lot of stuff that is just there to fill some sort of emotional void that we have? That we fill that box up with stuff that gives us a momentary pleasure or satisfaction, maybe around food or sex or relationships or trying to get the approval of other people. But the truth about a lot of that stuff, if we were honest with ourselves, is it doesn't last very long. So we're always having to put it in the box and we become very dependent on the process of always having to get more of it and put it back in the box. And the more we're dependent on that, the less dependent we are on the goodness of God. 
So I want us to talk today about the spiritual practice or taking up the spiritual habit of what I'm calling unplugging. Now that, of course, is not the phrase that our our spiritual ancestors would have used, but I think it's appropriate for our world and our culture. You think about how we're plugged in to so much busyness all the time. I, I think we could probably argue that some of us are literally plugged in, right? I mean, if you visited my house, I mean, don't visit my house unless you call ahead of time, but if you visited my house... There are times you would find me sitting in my favorite chair. I've got my earbuds in, listening to something on my, my iPod. I'm scrolling through some book on my e-reader, and I've got the TV on, you know, watching that all at the same time. Many of us live lives like that, don't we, where we're constantly plugged into busyness all the time. It's really there to just sort of distract us, isn't it? So what would life be like if we unplugged from some of that, if we just gave ourselves permission for a while to unplug from some of that. Now, our spiritual ancestors did do that. They had a word for it. They called it fasting. Now, what do you think of when I say the word fasting? What are you fasting from? Food, right? And so immediately some of you are going, whoa, 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 don't go there, right? I like food. I I don't want you messing with my food. Don't tell me that you're telling me to take up some spiritual practice where I got to give up eating my favorite foods. Well, I understand your concern. I'm a big fan of food. I'm the guy that put on five or 10 pounds over the Christmas holidays, so I I know about food and I understand your concern. And so I want us to sort of set that aside today. This idea that fasting is mostly about letting go of food in our lives. That can be an expression of the fast, right? We have lots of examples of that in scripture. We know that Jesus fasted. In fact, at one point he said to his followers, when you fast, he didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. So there's some assumption that we should all take up that practice of fasting, but you can fast from all sorts of things, can't you? You can fast from spending too much time on social media. You can fast from worry. You can fast from watching the news on TV. You can fast from judgment of other people. You can fast from working too much or exercising too much or whatever it might be. There are all kinds of ways you can participate in the fast, but the ultimate concern of the fast is making room in your life for God, making some space in our overcrowded, overscheduled lives for a little more experience of God's spirit, of God's presence. And really at the center of the fast, it's not what you're giving up. It's that you're making room for God's justice. Now, when I say the word justice to you, what pops into your head? What do you think of when I say the word justice? Maybe you're thinking of law and order. You're thinking about good guys and bad guys and people going to jail or to prison and people getting their just desserts and and justice coming down as a judgment on another person. But that is not the biblical understanding of justice. In both the Christian scriptures and the Jewish scriptures, the biblical understanding of justice really comes down to one simple word, enough. Say that word with me, enough. Biblical justice is the idea that all people would have enough enough of what God wants them to have. Just enough of what God wants them to have. Well, what does God want all people to have? If you think about the stories we tell in Scripture, the way we have come to understand who or what God is, what does God want all of us, all people in the world, to have enough of? Food, shelter, clothing, love, compassion, dignity, community, Grace, forgiveness, all of those things. The idea of biblical justice was that everybody would have enough of all of that. It doesn't mean we'd all have the same amount of all those things. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just saying everybody, if the world were just the way God would have it be just, everybody would have enough of all of that to live the quality of life that the biblical God believes that all people should have. And the problem is, and here's what we're finding in our scripture text today, is our Spiritual forebears, the Israelites, forgot about that. They were practicing the fast, but they forgot about the justice. They got really good at being good religious people. In fact, the scripture starts out today, we're hearing them talking to God, saying, God, why don't you pay attention to us? Look at what we've been doing. We get together and we worship you all the time like we're supposed to do. And we pray all the time like we're supposed to do. And we're humble. We're so humble. You can't believe we're so good at being humble. Nobody's better at being humble than us, God. And we fast. We do the fast just like you told us. We give up our food when we're supposed to. We're doing all these things, God. Why don't you hear us? Why don't you see us? Why are you letting all these injustices happen to us? And in essence, God's response in Scripture is, you people got to be kidding me. I don't see you. You don't see me. I don't hear you. You're not hearing me. 
You're experiencing injustice. Have you looked at yourselves? You're participating in injustice against the oppressed people, the people that are poor and homeless and naked and, and, and the outcast. You've forgotten about them. You've participated in injustices against them. You've ignored the injustices that they're experiencing. You're not the victims here. You are the victimizers. You see, what they forgot was the spiritual practice of the fast can't just be some inward moral piety that we practice. It also has to have an outward social ethic. It has to show itself somehow in the way that we live in the world. And that's true, really, isn't it, of all our spiritual practices. Everything we come together to do when we're in worship here, everything you might do in your private prayer life, your private worship life, all of those things are for a while meant to turn us inward into contemplation and thought about God and who God wants us to be. But the ultimate goal of every spiritual practice is to turn us then outward into the world to live out that social ethic God has for us, to live out God's justice, God's just enough for all people. And of course, that means that sometimes we're going to be inconvenienced by living out that justice, right? It's not always going to be easy to do that. They were so involved in the worship they were doing, they went to just the easy part, the part that said, it's all about me. It's all about my relationship with God. It's all about what God's going to do for us. And God's saying, it's not all about you. It's also about what you do for the world. And at times that's going to cost you something and it's going to be inconvenient. 1968, Memphis, Tennessee, The African-American sanitation workers are at the height of their tensions with the leaders of the city over their working conditions. The African-American sanitation workers were doing a job for very little pay. They got no benefits at all. They got no time off, no vacation. If they called in sick, their job probably wasn't going to be there the next day, and they worked under very dangerous conditions. In fact, the whole situation, as some of you know, came to a head in Memphis, Tennessee, when two of those African-American sanitation workers were horribly killed in an accident on the job. And the city wasn't going to do anything about it. And so those African-American sanitation workers walked off the job. They took a fast. They unplugged. They took a time out in order to participate in justice for all of them. They walked off the job. And two days later, they went on strike. Now, Martin Luther King gets word of what's happening in Memphis, Tennessee, and he decides that he's got to go there and be in solidarity with them. He's going to lead them in a a peaceful march through the city. And that's exactly what he does. He shows up. They organize this peaceful march. 5,000 people get out into the streets to do this peaceful march, and then What happens? Well, as often happens in a peaceful march, there are some people there who aren't there to be peaceful. And it's it's estimated that maybe 200 people broke off from the crowd and began committing acts of vandalism. They began breaking windows of stores. And the police officers used this as an excuse to move in, not just against the people that were committing the acts of vandalism, but they moved in on all of the protesters, all of the marchers and demonstrators, all of the peaceful demonstrators. And in the midst of the chaos, a 16-year-old African-American young man was shot and killed by the police. And the city used that as an excuse to put a curfew on everybody. They called in the National Guard. And Martin Luther King's advisor said to him, we've got to get you out of town. You cannot be associated with this violence. It looks bad. We've got to get you out of here. And so King and his advisors very quietly slipped out of town. And in fact, that's sort of how the news media played it, that he'd run away. And that was supposed to be the end of it. King had a very busy itinerary. He had all these other places he was supposed to be. He was planning a trip to Africa that he was about to leave on. He had other things to do, but he knew that he couldn't leave the situation the way it was. He knew he had to go back to Memphis. In a sense, he had to be willing to unplug, to take a fast from the busy schedule, the plans he already had laid out for himself. He had to fast from that in order to make space to go back and participate in this act of justice that he felt he was being called to at that time. And so a week later, he did go back to Memphis, Tennessee. He gave there the speech that we now know as the I have seen the mountaintop, I've been to the mountaintop speech. He led a peaceful demonstration in the city of Memphis. 
And the very next day, he was shot and killed. And two weeks later, the sanitation workers' strike ended. The city gave in to many of their demands. They received a raise in pay. So one wonders what would have happened if King hadn't been willing to take a fast from his other plans, his carefully laid out itinerary, in order to participate in this act of justice. What would have happened differently, maybe, in that situation? How would we as a country be different today if Martin Luther King had not decided to take a fast or unplug from all the other things he could have done with his life that would have been much easier and instead center his life in God's justice, God's just enough for all people? I think it's worth remembering, and we forget this all the time, that at the time of his death, King was not the beloved figure that he is now in the United States. Public opinion had really, to the greatest degree, turned against him. He was not seen as the guy who gave great speeches like he is now, or the guy that preached love and brotherhood. He was known by many Americans as the guy who had run afoul of the law. He'd been arrested many times. He had run afoul of the United States government. He had spoken against the Vietnam War. He had spoken against the death penalty. He had called America to look right in the face of its institutionalized oppression and racism. But he was willing to do all of that for the sake of God's justice, God's just enough for all people. He was willing to let his life be inconvenienced for the sake of justice. The one has to wonder, though, is justice really that inconvenient? I mean, maybe it's only inconvenient if we don't see it as part of who we are, as part of our calling as people of God. And so I think if we're seeing ourselves as people that are called to participate in God's justice, we maybe need to hear the same call that Martin Luther King heard, that Jesus heard, that Dorothy Day heard, that so many people in history have heard, which is sometimes we've got to unplug from all the things we want to be doing, all the distractions of our lives, all the things that entertain us and keep our minds busy to focus on the really important things. What are the things that God wants us putting in that box and what things need to come out so there's room for what God wants us to be doing and thinking and learning and being about, sometimes it means we're going to be inconvenienced, right? Justice ain't easy. There's a cost to participating in God's justice. It might literally be a financial cost, but for some of us, the cost of participating in justice might be an emotional cost. It might be a cost of our comfort. It might be a cost of our, the goodwill of other people or our good reputation in our community if we dare to stand up and work for justice. And I think to participate in God's justice, it also means we need to move past the sin of our indifference. We may be, that's the thing. Maybe more than anything else, the thing we as Christians need to unplug from, to take a fast from, is the sin of indifference. That allows us to see the problems in the world, but kind of put blinders on to say, well, you know, if you'll just give me a a warm house to live in and some food on the table and a decent job and some entertainment to distract me from, if you'll just give me that, I'll go along. I won't rock the boat. I'll pretend I don't see what's going on in the rest of the world. Or the sin of indifference that allows us to see the problems but say, that guy's problems over there, they're not my problems. Or this woman's problems over there, look, she's probably to blame for them in the first place. So I don't have anything to do with that. The challenge of the fast, maybe, then, is to let go of that stuff so we have room to participate in God's compassion, peace, and justice in the world. So what would the fast look like for you? If you said, all right, Brian, tomorrow I'm going to take up the fast, what, what does it look like? Well, as I said earlier, it looks different for everybody. What you would fast from might not be what the people over here would fast from. The question is, what's crowding God's spirit, God's justice out of your life? How do you let it go at least for a time in order to make room for God's justice, God's peace and love to move within and without from you? And if you really want some ideas about how to get that started in your life in simple ways, there's an insert in your bulletin today. It kind of lays out a really simple plan for how you might start contemplating what what your fast might be and how long it might be and what it might look like and how to get somebody else involved in helping you with it. And you can move on from there. But I just want want to remind us something made to put out in front of us today as a final thought. Something we need to remember because it's clear from the text today our spiritual ancestors forgot about this and we'll forget about this too if we don't stay vigilant and help each other remember. 
As important as it is for us to gather as Christians communally, as important as it is for us to come together like this and to bow our heads and close our eyes and pray and turn inward and listen for God's voice, it is equally as important for us to then, at some point, lift our heads back up, open our eyes, see the reality of the world around us, see the way the world could be if we followed God's justice, to open those folded hands, stretch them out, and get to work sharing the goodness of God with the world. Let's pray. Creator God, we celebrate today your justice. And we're excited about the many ways we get to be part of that. The ways we get to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and welcome in the homeless and, and speak out for those who are being oppressed. Help us as we continue to worship in this time together to center ourselves in that justice and let it call us out into a life centered in you. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.